Uh, I'm Grant Whitney, treasurer of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. Um, just want to give a big thank you to everyone uh, for who's at our at part, well, excuse me, at our presentation right now. Um, really excited to have uh, Dr. Christian Hins here. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. I got it. Practiced it beforehand, so hopefully I'm not. Um, uh, so just want to give a, a kind of quick update and kind of things on the horizon before we shift to the presentation. Um, so next week uh, we're going to be hosting a uh, presentation outlining some some key findings from the uh, former UK Vice Chief of Staff um, in the UK uh, and just kind of about analytical approaches to national security gaming. Uh, and then two weeks from now on May 18th, um, presentation on tabletop games for the virtual learning environment. So uh, if you want to, if either of those events pique your interest, please do go on guwargaming.org uh, and there's links for anyone to sign up. Tonight, however, I'm really excited to have, like I said, Dr. Christiane Hins here talk about critical theory and game design. Um, I got a brief look at your resume. It's much more impressive than, than I'm going to you know, give credit to. So I, I, I don't want to try and butcher it myself. I'll let you kind of introduce yourself. But uh, just for everyone who's uh, attending, um, we do ask that you keep your videos and mics off um, just to kind of uh, avoid the amount of background noise and distraction. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, please do toss them in the chat. Uh, for any questions, um, I'll kind of keep a log of them uh, and we'll have uh, a break. I think you said in the, in the middle that we can address some of the questions mm -hmm. and then the extent we have any at the end, um, I'll log those as well. So uh, without further ado, please take it away and, and thank you again for coming. Well, um, as far as the self-introduction is concerned, my name is Christian Hintz and I am Associate Professor of History at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Uh, where I teach all of the Asian history curriculum. My PhD is in modern Japanese history with minor fields in business history and, and world history. And um, my research, uh, at least regarding Japan, has to do with gender, material culture, business, um, and the kind of meanings that are generated when women make businesses and make objects and material culture. Um, but I also am responsible for teaching uh, the part of one of the, one of the people responsible for teaching the world history series here at SIUE. And uh, I developed a course, Gaming World History, the first 50,000 years um, that's gamified uh, for teaching my, my half of that two, two semester course. Um, and so my research has shifted to gamification, um, game design um, with classroom, classroom applications um, and assessing the efficacy of game design and the efficacy of game related pedagogies. So my, my research has bifurcated um, in a number of directions. Um, so that's all there's about me. I would like to say that I'm, uh, I'm broadcasting, broadcasting from my home. Um, and I hope everyone, I've, I've, I've you know, hung a sword over my kids' heads about being quiet, um, but you may hear them quarreling in the background. I hope not. Um, you may hear my dog bark. Um, you may hear my chickens in the yard. Um, so don't be distracted. That is just the reality of my life and the reality of COVID academia. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this from home. Okay. Um, I guess we could get started. I guess that's really all I have to say. The first thing I'm going to do is um, just do a brief outline of what's going to happen in our two hours together um, and kind of just outline the, 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 direction that our, our conversation is going to go. Okay, so I'm going to start first just by explaining to you what gaming world history is, because everything we'll be discussing will be, I'll be giving examples from the model, modeling that game, using that game as a model to discuss our ideas. Uh, I'll give a quick discussion of what critical theory is, because, you know, a lot of people read the title of this talk, and I saw, I saw like people's hair go a little gray, um, but we'll do a quick talk about what critical theory is. Then we have to come to a, a similar understanding of what world history is, because if we don't, nothing will, nothing else will make sense. Okay, and then I'll talk briefly about the game that we'll be talking about more specifically. So, game world history is a course that is also a gamified course, and inside of it, there are a lot of little games. So, we're going to be using the game Urbanity. One nineteen, no, eight, two thousand eighteen teams, a team from two thousand eighteen. We're going to be using a map that that we built together in that game um, as our example. Okay, can you click again? 
All right. Then we'll get to the chewy part um, of the presentation where I'm going to talk about the foundational theories that are inside of the map that I, I layer into the maps that I use for this course, okay? And so we'll be talking about historical materialism in the Null School. Please don't let your brain, you know, get anxious about this. All the stuff will be explained, all right? Um, I'll talk about uh, thermodynamics and big history. I'll talk about corollaries to, and historical material, materialist hypotheses. Um, we'll talk about social, like sociological matters. Uh, um, I'm just trying to synthesize this. Um, and we'll talk about how to how I have built um, resource instability into into the map. Um, can we click one more, please? Oh, then we'll have a quick Q and A session. You can uh, you know go get a, a cup of coffee or whatever, and uh, I'll, I'll field questions. Especially because critical theory sometimes makes people uncomfortable, so it's a chance for us to to talk about that if if that's needed. Then next slide, okay. Then we're going to talk about the political sociology of exchange, because you can't talk about world history and not talk about trade. And I want us to understand how you can build um, the rules of trade into a map so that you can teach this matter without necessarily having to um, talk about it. I want the students to encounter it, uh, not just hear it from a lecture, okay? And then I'll talk a little bit about the utility of mapping theory, um, building theory into maps, um, and hopefully uh, I will not have confused you terribly, but that's where we'll end up, okay? And then we'll have more questions and answers, all right? Okay, let's talk about uh, gaming world history, the first 50,000 years. You're looking at a piece of artwork, a piece of graffiti that uh, the team from the year we're talking about made um, to represent or to speak to uh, a mass famine event that happened in uh, their empire. Um, if I want a full belly, I have to eat lies, is the kind of, you know, vengeful protest of people in their city who are starving. And Gaming World History, can you click, click forward to the next slide, please? Gaming World History is the first half, I've mentioned this, of an introductory world history series. Usually it's taught in two halves, like this is the first half, okay? And it's fully gamified, meaning that the entire course is framed as a competition, okay? And that it's a game-based course, meaning that inside of it, there are five embedded games, each of which is meant to model a particular thing, a particular theme or a particular issue, okay? Those games are integrated, meaning that the outcome of the first game influences the opening of the next game so that each one builds on each other, okay? And they're modular, meaning that if you run out of time, you can pull one out, or you can pull one out and put it in a different class that's not related to it. Um, so they're modular, okay? And it's based on project-based learning, all right? That means that students aren't writing papers. What they're doing is making historical artifacts. Throughout the entirety of the game, they're making graffiti or, you know, they're making epic poetry or they're making, actually, they actually make objects. I make them learn to spin yarn. Like they're, they're things that they're making that become the historical materials that they can use to analyze each other's empires, so the, the history of, they can make what, narratives about each other's um, regional empires, right? Ultimately you get to empire, this game isn't about it. This discussion isn't about empire, but, okay. It runs from between 25 to 60 students. So I've taught it with as many as, as few as 25 and with as many as 60. It's taught to freshmen and sophomores and I've used it in both the general and honor school, the honors college populations. Um, can you click forward, please, or click the next thing, please? Okay. Now, what, what stands out to people when I talk about gaming world history the most is that even though I'm using real world historical principles, even though uh, a good deal of course content deals with world history, I mean, I mean, of like, you know, Rome and Mesopotamia, like recognizable places, the game itself takes place in an imaginary world, all right? Um, so they are going to prax practice, right? Um, the things that they learn, the concepts and principles that they learn uh, in class, they're going to practice that on the game, but the game is in an imaginary space. And why do I, why do, I do that? Um, it's because uh, many students have a preconceived or, you know, received knowing about the past um, that gets in the way of them actually learning about the past. <laughs> 
Um, so just because they know that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, if they're playing Rome, they're going to try to cross the Rubicon. And that doesn't tell me they've learned anything except something that they already think that they know. All right. So I've got to take them out of the real world and put them in an imaginary world in order to strip out um, the shadows that are inside of their minds about what the past is so they, they can actually see the, the principles that I am arguing um, inform historical processes. Right. So I got to I got to break their belief in um, their belief in that. OK, in in but separate them from their experience and put them in a, in a, in a raw or alien experience for them to, to actually practice the theories that I'm putting forward, all right? Otherwise, they can't, they can't see. They're stuck in the real world, okay? Uh, one more uh, click, please, all right? And this course, even though it's for freshmen and sophomore, it explicitly introduces students to theory-driven history. Um, that is, uh, theory, these are ways of interpreting their techniques for for collecting information, their techniques for interpreting information, and it's a technique for building a narrative. History is a, a narrative, a form of narrative, right? And I want them to understand that there are many, many different angles from which you can look at a historical question. Um, and so I'm having them look at these historical questions using particular series of angles that I tell them explicitly, look, we're looking at this from this particular historical angle or this particular analytical angle. So um, that's, that's in a nutshell, what Gaming World's History as a course is. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right. Now, broadly writ, Gaming World's History asks a very a, a pithy but important question, okay? I'm asking what forces explain the varieties and variations in human political economies? All right, that emerged between the late Paleolithic period and the 15th century. So the subject matter is concretely political economy. Okay, um, it's not uh, imperial states. It's not um, a kind of uh, what evolutionary discussion of how humans change over time or anything like that. It's very specifically about a particular subject. Next slide, please. Okay, now. Can you click it this one more time, please? And maybe one more time. There you go. All right. Nobody likes critical theory, right? Um, especially historians who traditionally have uh, thought about history as something that's very straightforward. Uh, history is what happened in the past as discovered by people looking in primary documents, right? You go to the archive, you pull out a bunch of uh, letters and diaries and, you know, uh, diplomatic communiques and I don't know, all kinds of material, whatever the material that people wrote down in the past, whatever material they made, and you look at it and then you figure out, okay, what happened, all right? Um, but, you know, this is one of those phenomenological questions. How do you know what you know? How do you think you know? How did you come to know what you think you know? What forces allow you to know? These? Like you, you can start to pick at whether or not it's really true that you can know what happened in the past, all right? And critical theory, um, scary as it seems, as obnoxious as it is, because a lot of it's written in this very like abstruse language that like only insiders are supposed to understand, which in fact, insiders don't understand, but they pretend they understand it. Like it's a whole nightmare, okay? But in spite of that, it's really useful. It's really useful. So even though historians don't like critical theory, unlike people who are doing English or sociology or any other field in the social sciences, right? Historians, in my opinion, have to swallow it. They have to take the pill. And I begin my freshman students with this kind of approach. This isn't fun reading. Um, but it's work, and we're here to do work, so this is the work. And then I use a game to make the work less painful, okay? Can I have the next slide, please? Let's talk about what, what, what critical theory is. First of all, it's a tool, okay? It's an analytical tool. It's a technique. It's a particular technique, okay? And you shouldn't be surprised that any, any tool that you use um, opens up particular kinds of information about the subject matter. All right, so you know, all of us are born with really, really cool analytical tools, right? We got five senses, we've got memory, you know, we've got a prefrontal frontal cortex, like we got all this kind of hardware that we're built with that helps us to 
understand a thing. So we look at a tree and we say, wow, okay, it has these qualities. It looks like this. It acts like that, right? Uh, you know, if I look at the trees around it, I realize this one's different from that tree in this way or that way, right? And then I begin to make some conclusions about, oh, this is a redwood compared to some other kind of tree that's around it, okay? So here I've used tools uh, to open up something about the, the nature of an object, okay? Can I have another, another uh, click, please? If, however, you use a different tool, right? What you can know about the thing is different, right? So here we've cut with a tool that we, could, we couldn't have used just with our eyes, right? So we've found a tool to cut, and now this tells us something different. And if you use the tool in two different ways, you get two different cuts, which shows you something else about the material that, that's under consideration, okay? Can I have one more click, please? What happens if you use a totally different tool, one that's like a borer, I don't know, pulls a core out of the tree, okay? Or what if you use an electron microscope? There are 10 gazillion tools you could bring to bear to understand something about the object in question, right? Now, what you can do with what you've learned about the object using a particular tool, can I have the next slide, please? Tells you what you can make out of it, right? So you have theory and you've used the right theory you learn something about the material that then will allow you to make a coherent story, all right? But if you're not using this tool, you can't make this story. Can I have the next slide, please? Not the next slide, the next image. So you have to have made a certain kind of cut with a certain kind of tool to make the bowl. It wouldn't have occurred to you that you could do it if the only thing you could use is a different tool, all right? So think about critical theory as a range of tools that give you some insight into an object. And then out of those objects that you've looked at using these tools, you begin to make a coherent kind of narrative, a coherent story, a coherent object that reveals something about the subject that we're talking about. So I'm gonna be using a lot of these kind of uh, metaphor similes to explain complicated things, but this is essentially all that critical theory is, all right? And no one critical theory can capture the totality of what the thing is. It's just a tool to approach what the thing is, okay? All right, I, I hope that that makes you more comfortable with dealing with some of the theories that we'll be dealing with throughout the rest of the, of, of the talk, okay? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I would imagine by this point, uh, everybody has taken a course in world history either in college or in high school. Um, when I was coming up, there was no such thing. Uh, you know, you learned about the United States and maybe you learned about the West, which is, you know, some kind of, I don't know, it's a strange thing to think about the West as being a coherent thing. Um, but world history is not how it's often taught um, in introductory courses, right? So one of the things that world history is not is an overview of the historical, the significant, the, the historical events of significance uh, around the world. It's not kind of like a smorgasbord, you know, where you go and have a little bit of this, have a little bit of that, have a little bit of the other thing. Sometimes even if the professors who are teaching it, history teachers who are teaching it know that's wrong, it's very hard to make connections to show how all of those things are part of a single story. All right, so students come away from having taken these courses uh, thinking that it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they miss the, the connective tissue that's holding it all together into a single story, all right? So it's not that. And I teach world history the way I do in order to subvert the kind of world history people have come away with. Not that they were mistaught, but they may have misperceived that it's, you know, that it's, that it's about separate things when it's only about one thing. Okay, so let's click one more time and see what it is. Okay, this is my opinion. Okay, it's a range of theories and techniques that attempt to address big questions. If you're going to ask big questions that deal with the entirety of the globe, all human beings, whether it's the past uh, 50,000 years or the past 1200 years, uh, you've got to have very particular theories and very particular techniques to ask questions about that scale. Okay, click again, please. Okay, because we're asking questions in world history that are really, really big, 
World historians tend to be cautious of the notion of human agency. We'll look at this a little bit more when we talk about the Annals School. But here's the point. You know, as you, as you telescope out to think about the globe as a single unit of analysis, or as you telescope out to try to think of what kind of forces are pushing or shaping the human experience, the human historical experience, uh, individual historical actors get real tiny. You can't, you can't see them anymore, right? You telescope out and the Julius Caesar gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you don't want to ever talk about him, right? So the notion of human agency, when you're asking these big questions, right? What power did one historical actor have to affect the entire world? Um, and I don't mean their world, I mean the entire world, like then not very much, okay? Can I click one more time, please? So we're cautious of the notion of human agency, and we understand that the primary documents made by people in the past are necessarily myopic, meaning that um, Napoleon Bonaparte can write in his diary all he wants, I did this, I did that, I did the other thing, and the world changed because of me. He can say all that all he wants, but he doesn't know. If you ask me why I did what I did yesterday, and I tell you, you shouldn't believe me, you shouldn't believe me because human beings can't see the whole picture. We can't get enough, we're in the trees, we're in the weeds, we can't see the forest, okay? So it's not that Napoleon Bonaparte is, Bonaparte is lying or is wrong, it's just that he's myopic. He can only see what's in front of his nose. So if you ask him what caused this, you'll say, I caused this. And a world historian's gonna go like, hmm, hmm, maybe not, okay? Can you click again? Okay. World history necessarily violates traditional senses of time, traditional senses of space, okay, in order to get at correlation and to get at causation. So if I want to understand something about, oh, I don't know, political economy, which is this huge topic, and I want to understand how political economy um, emerges and changes and what, what, what forces shape it, right? Um, then I need to do more than like, I'm a Japanist who does modern Japan. That's 1868 to the present. Like that's too small of a bite of time to talk about Japanese, you know, uh, political economy. Like I gotta, I gotta stretch way back, you know, to talk about political economy in Japan or political economy around the world, right? So you, you can stretch time in whatever ways you need to um, access causation when you're dealing with a big scale. And it's the same with space as well kind of histories that you're used to seeing, regional histories, national histories. Um, you know, these, uh, you, the whole idea of Europe, right? Um, actually, as an Asianist, this is true too, but the whole idea of Europe as its own continent is nonsense from a world's historical position, right? There's, it's all one space from the Pacific to the Atlantic, right? From the, you know, from the North Pole to the Southern tip of, you know, the Indian subcontinent, like it, it's all one space. You can't talk about it as, you know, these little, these little locations, okay? So scale is something that's very different in world history. Can I click again, please? Okay. And just like it's cautious of the notion of human agency, that is human power to change things, right? It's tiptoes, it tiptoes with the notion of historical significance of a particular event, right? So usually, you know, we would like to um, claim that, you know, World War I is a world-changing historical event. And at certain scales, that's absolutely right. But in the scale of uh, Homo sapiens as a species, you know, that, that may not be the most significant thing. So it, we're careful with understanding what's significant in terms of historical events. It all depends on scale. Okay. Can I have another click? All right. And here's the last point is that it ne it's necessarily a synthetic, a synthetic field, okay? Meaning that uh, me as one historian who wants to ask the big questions, I cannot get enough primary documents from the whole world in one lifetime to do this kind of work. So I have to synthesize the secondary sources, the, the research of geologists and climatologists and botanists and sociologists and historians and economists. So like there are all these other fields that it necessarily has to synthesize in order to approach answering big questions. So this is what, this is the thing that I'm trying to introduce freshmen to, freshmen and sophomores to, world history in this kind of mode. All right, can we keep going? Okay, so let me tell you about the gamer vanity. 
Uh oh. First, I'm going to tell you this, okay? I am trained as a historian and as a linguist for Japan, right? Uh, I am not a cartographer. I am not a geographer. Uh, I am an old D and D person who did world building with like colored pencils and like graph paper before there was even hexagonal paper, right? Like I'm that old, okay? So um, I want us to step away from what we understand about real maps and think about maps as a communication tool um, that can be as sophisticated as you need or as simple as you need. It is simply a kind of a graph. And the reason I'm saying this is because just because I do world history and the maps that I play with are um, geographical, all right, it doesn't mean that your game, which is not geographical, is not nevertheless something that can be expressed in a map, all right? I mean, you think about it, Monopoly is a map, right? It doesn't look like any place. Monopoly is a map. Shoots and Ladders is a map, right? It doesn't have to look like Civ to be map-based, okay? And even you can think about your games and your game design conceptually in the sense that, well, maybe it's not a movement-based game, but still how you want your players to move through scenarios or move through like logic, like logic loops, right? That's all stuff that's mappable, okay? And if it doesn't, if you can map it for yourself, even if it's not something that you need your, 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 your players to play in terms of helping you understand, okay, this is the theory that's pushing my players. This is how I need my players to respond. So therefore I have to add these forces. So mapping is useful, whether or not you're doing this kind of, you know, my kind of dinky world building with a pencil um, fooling around, all right? But I mean, I had to start here because, uh, you know, I have the skills that I have and I lack the skills that I lack. But you know, when I drew this and I started drawing this, right, I began to realize like, oh, look, this is like a giant caldera. Like you can kind of imagine, right? There's an inland sea and then there's kind of a ring around it of some, you know, islands. And this, I was thinking of this when I drew it of place in Japan that has, you know, a city inside of a caldera, <laughs> you know, and it, you know um, this would have to be an extinct one, but uh, the one in Japan is not. Okay. Um, can you click again? So urbanity is map-based, movement-based. It has resource acquisition and production the way, say, a sieve would, a tech tree like a sieve would. It's an accounting game and it has RPG all layered on top of each other. So in terms of the mechanics, these are the basic mechanics of the game, okay? And uh, students play 10 rounds in five weeks, which means there's no time to fool around, okay? If you're going to um, achieve the winning condition or it's not really winning condition so much as um, put yourself into a really good position for the next game, you have to have a plan and you have to have a hypothesis and execute it rather, relatively quickly, okay? So it's 10 rounds in five weeks. And this is what this game is trying to get students to think about. I want them to think about uh, what explains the proliferation of city-states in the Copper Age and the Bronze Age, okay? What explains the variations in Copper Bronze Age urban political economies? Where, how, and why were some city-states able to scale up political economic power over others and to what effect, okay? Oh, sorry, click, click. There may be another one. There you go. Okay, so at the at the end of the previous game, oops, go back one. Can you go back one? There you go. At the end of the previous game, which is called Bosses and Bossed. Oh, can you go forward one? Okay, stop there. <laughs> at the end of the previous game, Bosses and Bossed, the students have developed. Um, mega villages along the line of agricultural villages that models the, the emergence of vertical hierarchy in Neolithic, early Neolithic political economies. Okay, sorry for the noise. Okay. So you think about this as Mesopotamia, it's Katalhayuk or Jericho. And the question that I really want them to think about and what I want them to experience is what you see in the next slide. I mean, the next image, same slide, next image. Okay, where you've got an explosion of city-states 
in the region, and not just as an explosion of city-states, but you get kingdoms that control multiple city-states. So how do you get from you know, very early kind of rudimentary urbanization to much more complex form of urbanization, all right? Um, another issue about urbanity that's important to know, there are five teams, okay? Or it's actually multiples of five teams. So I can play this game with 10 teams or 15 teams, but it's always in units of five. There are five teams, and each team has its own geospace, in a sense, their, their own their own place. So this is this map is one team's map, okay? And it is climatologically, geographically, hydrologically, entirely different from the maps that the other four teams are playing. They're all playing different maps, okay? Can I have the next slide, please? or next image, please. All right, so the game objectives, you're gonna begin with a single city state, like your little Katal Hoyuk, right? And you're going to expand and assert political economic control over your assigned region to the greatest extent possible. Now there's no winning condition except that the next game, which is about empire, right? The further out you're able to expand your influence and power, the advantage, greater advantage you have over everybody else in the next, in the next game. All right, so they're able to complete achievement points and to accumulate team experience points, um, but otherwise there's no real fixed end to this game. It's just building a map towards uh, a more complicated game. All right, so the final game map determines the starting map conditions for the next game, which is called Empire. Okay, now the next slide. All right, now there are a lot of theories in play here. Okay, we'll start with the most basic one. Okay, um, and it's historical materialism. Can you click again? Okay. Now, if you've read your Karl Marx carefully, you will know that he makes the argument um, that social relations, by which he means kinship relations, uh, political relations, uh, economic relations, all range of how humans connect with each other in order to meet their needs, right? Those are dependent on the material conditions in which they find themselves, okay? And this shouldn't surprise anybody that um, gatherer and hunters uh, living in, oh, I don't know, well, let me, let me not use the gathering and hunting example, but the, the political structure that you would find in, um, oh, I don't know, uh, Oceania, uh, uh, Polynesia, is not the same as the political and economic structures that you would find in Mesopotamia. These are not, not the same because the material conditions in which they're living are, are, the, are not the same, right? Um, you should expect things to be particularly dif different because you got one place where you got a lot of island hopping, right? Um, and, uh, you know, in one place you got all this like deep, deep, beautiful soil and, you know, it's just very different places. So you should expect to have different kinds of outcomes, all right? And to build on that, you should not be surprised that the material conditions are shaped by environment, climate, other forces that are uh, bigger and over which humans have no real say. So that social relations are in some ways, no, let's say it this way. It's not that social relations are determined by material conditions. Right? It's that social relations are limited. There are certain kinds of social relations you have to have if you're living in the Arctic, and there are some kinds of social relations you can't have. And in between, there are all these options. Okay? So this is historical materialism, right? Um, and I, I don't want us to oversimplify this to say that, um, you know, geography is destiny, like that's something that's said fairly regularly. It can't be destiny. It's just that it has a powerful influence on the choices that you can make, that people can make. And variations, um, there are many, many variations. And there's no determinants, there's no determinants of what it has to be. This is where Marx is wrong. But at any rate, can we have the next half of this slide, please? So historical materialism is one piece of it. And then the Anal School is another. Okay, and the Anal School argument 
uh, fits very nicely or resonates very nicely with uh, historical materialism. And that is that things that take place in short spans of time, what Brodel calls event time, okay? Event time itself is the amount of time in which things that influence us happen that we notice, okay? So, you know, you can identify events year to year and say, whoa, you know, COVID, whoa, this thing happened and it changed everything. Like, oh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to get too political. You know, Russian meddling, I don't know, that, that affects everything. Like, oh, right, Kim Jong-il is doing this or doing that. Oh, like all of these things happen. You can read the newspaper and see events taking place one after the other, after the other, after the other, okay? But Brodell says that you can't really understand the causes of event time because humans are myopic. The documents are myopic, right? Humans will always attribute the cause of something to themselves. We did this or we didn't do that, okay? So to really start to get an understanding of events that happen you know, in a way that you know, no, humans notice, you gotta stretch time to include things that happen at a, a slower pace, social time, okay? And social time means in a sense, um, trends that take place over maybe two or three generations, things that change slower, institutions change show, slow, slowly. I mean, social relations, this is, this is where social time, that's where social time is, th things are taking place in social time. Right. Um, you know, capitalism, how it operates now in 2000, where are we? 21 is very different than how it operated in 2000, in, in 1966 when I was born. It's not the same beast anymore. OK, um, technology isn't the same beast anymore. Our relationship with our parents is not the same beast anymore. Right. So race relations is not the same beast anymore. Right. These are things that, that change much more slowly that have implications for event time. So social time, things taking place in social time are pushing things that happen in event time, according to Brodel and the Annal School over in France, okay? And then he makes even a bigger argument that social time itself has around it or it's embedded inside of events that take place in something he calls geologic time, okay? And these are slow, very hard to notice, changes um, that no one would ever really think to ascribe to causing political economy to be a particular shape or institution to be a particular shape or technology to be a particular shape, all right? But, you know, if you wanted to make the argument that, um, you know, we tend to think about uh, the Mongol empire as being the result of a particular genius, Genghis Khan, right? Well, the Null School said that's not, that's not a sufficient that's not a sufficient explanation. You know, Genghis Khan's genius is noted in the documents because later Mongols wrote that down about him for whatever reason, all right? But you might notice if you take a bunch of ice core samples around the area and around the globe that there was a little tiny ice age, right? That has to do with the wobble of the planet, right? That may have caused um, an ecosystem problem that made the pastoralist nomadic people of that area change how they were organized, right? This is how uh, a null school um, world history analysis is gonna think about these kinds of things, which is how come Genghis Khan gets real small in this analysis. If you're gonna think about, okay, well, when is it gonna get cold for a reason and reduce grazing area for pastoralist nomads, right? So these are two theories that are operating inside of game world history, okay? Can we have next slide? Okay, so if I'm making an argument that human beings create societies that are appropriate to the ecosystem in which they're living, okay, then I have to start to build an ecosystem, right? This is, you know, this is dinky world building a la D&D &D 19. 1980, one or two, right? Um, but I'm thinking very particularly about how urban, early urban civilizations have to resource themselves um, in whatever location that they happen to be in. Now, these are going to be city-states in this particular kind of 
geography, this kind of place that is mountainous, um, that has some lowland wet areas, that has islands, has a lot of uh, access or coast, very coastal, right? Um, and this map is very different from another map that another team is playing, which may be Great River Valley kind of a thing. It may be like something, you know, up in Tibet, like there are these different, very different ecosystems that these people have to, my students have to try to um, wrestle with the, the ecosystem. So here I'm beginning to, I'm beginning to, you know, paint in some ideas about how this particular location is going to look but it's not just for looking right this is not like a, a tolkien map so that like a you know a map that belongs to a science fiction book or a fantasy book where it's just so you know which way people are going when they tell the story that's not what's happening here okay can you add an, another another layer can you click all right so this map has clues that my students need to think about right in order to understand how to access sufficient resources from this area to have a functional city state um, and to actually spread their power someplace right so you gotta look at this and the first thing that should pop in your head is where's the water going where's the water coming from right where is there uh where are those where's their resource pot potential is there a way in which you know this place is hard to move from one place to another or it's efficient to move how should we move should i bother to build roads in a place that has this much ocean front i don't know okay next slide or next click okay so at the beginning of this game, I give them a dossier full of maps, okay? Um, and we've been going over in class a lot of detail about weather and currents and, uh, you know, hydrology and where human beings, you know, tend to congregate in large numbers around the belly of the planet and why, okay? So if, you know, they look at this map and they realize that this, this little landmass is, you know, situated at 37 degrees north, if they've paid attention, they can make an analogy and get a sense of where other places have done, have had built city city states in this, in this, in this, in this, in this, in this latitude, right? Um, and here, you know, I've included something about uh, trade winds, which tells them something about, you can click again, but you know, this is gonna tell you something about where the rainfall is and where it's arid. Okay, it's going to tell you something about the potential for agricultural productivity, potential for transportation networks and nodes, right? And it's not like I give them a city and say, here, start from this location. What they need to do in this, in this game at the opening salvo is to choose a location that's going to maximize their ability to dominate this space. Okay, so they got to make this kind of like a guesswork based on a whole lot of lecturing about and examples from the quote unquote real world. Okay. So can you can you click click forward again? Okay. Now, of course, you I mean this is not surprising. You know, if you've played Civ in any of its 10 million iterations, then you know, you know that there have to be resources scattered across the space. Now, this map doesn't normally look this way, but I had to piddle with it so that maybe it'd be visible, visible to you. Okay. Um, and so there are scattered through this region resources that can be used by the players and will be used by the competing city states that are going to emerge in this area um, to, uh, to produce certain uh, manufacturers or uh, certain luxuries that can be traded or can be manipulated to be turned into useful items in one way or another. Okay, can you click? All right, so inside this game, uh, each, each city state has to manage some mandatory resources, okay? If you didn't know this, when human beings become sedentary and they switch to a, uh, a grain-based, starch-based diet, it causes all kinds of other troubles, right? So if you are largely an agricultural society, your access to protein is actually suppressed because if you're growing wheat everywhere, you don't have room to grow cattle or sheep, right? You don't want them to eat your wheat, okay? So you got to get protein and protein is often a problem for um, large, large empires, right? Very urban spaces. Um, they have to have relationships with people who actually grow meat, right? Either, you know, on the ocean or from someplace where there's less farming. Okay. So they have a problem with protein and they have a problem with salts. Gatherers and hunters don't have a problem with salts. For some reason, their diet doesn't mean them make them salt seeking in, in particular. Um, you get salt seeking when you switch to a grain that deer and cows eat, which is when you start eating grain, you start eating 
the products that come from grass, humans become salt seeking. All right, without salt, you die. Okay, so they have to maintain a certain amount of staples, a certain amount of access to protein and salt. And then in addition to those things, in order for their population to not decline or to grow. And in addition to those things, there are these other things they can manufacture, some of which are more necessary than others. Okay, um, so that's, that's what's happening. And you, you shouldn't be surprised. This kind of will smack of sieve, right? Can you click again? Okay, so with this kind of um, dossier of maps, okay, they're required to formulate location-specific hypotheses. What real-world analogs to this region might inform a successful strategy? What ecological and climate issues drive or limit agricultural productivity in your region? What types of urban political economies are likely to emerge in this kind of area? Which types of urban political economies will best be able to achieve regional domination? Okay, so they have to ask this question and then make a hypothesis by plunking themselves down on a map somewhere. Okay, can you click just once? Okay, so ta the task in terms of the opening salvo of the game is based on your assessment of your dossier, right? Choose a site for your city state, All right? Click again, please. And I believe this is the location that the team, the team Senderstone made in uh, 2018, where they chose as their opening site, uh, this little peninsula over here in a lowland kind of, uh, you know, lowland marsh area, that its base productivity is it will make 75 units of the, lo the locationally uh, appropriate grain per round, okay? And it will produce 20 lots of timber and 60 lots of flax. So when I look at this hypothesis, I'm thinking this is a team that is privileging agricultural productivity compared to the kind of productivity they would imagine in a mountainous region. It went someplace low and flat and wet, okay? Not a bad hypothesis, not the one I would have made, but not a bad hypothesis, okay? Can you click next? I think that might be time for a break. Let me see. All right, round one. Here's Team Centerstone's hypothesis, right? Click again. Oh, so we're going to look at my repost to their, to their hypothesis because my job is to play the competing city, city states, all right, um, that they're going to interact with. Okay, but we have to layer in more theory to know why I'm going to make the choices I'm going to make and what I intend for them to run into. Okay, on these maps. So now might be a time to run and get a cup of coffee or address some questions that are in the um, that are in the chat. Hey, Grant, are there any questions in the chat? I haven't been following it. Yeah, we have a, we have a couple. We had. Um... One, uh, sorry, I'm going through on my computer. I have them down. Um, we had a question just when you were talking about just kind of the, the length of, of time if you're doing an analysis. Um, we had a question from Sel uh, Selmani, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, who had asked, so if uh, 1860s until now is not enough time for that kind of um, long-term analysis, do you have kind of a, a generally speaking minimum adequate time span or does it, does it really kind of depend on the, um, I suppose the historical era. It depends on the question that you're asking, right? So um, if I want to study political economy, right? And I want to think, and I mean, I would never bother to study political economy in Japan. I can only study political economy and as a world historian, as a human, as a human thing, right? Um, if I wanted to study capitalism as a world historian, right? Then, you know, time, time depends on where you're talking about. If I want to study feudalism, right? Time depends on where you're talking about, right? Um, so you have to stretch it way, way, way back if you want to talk about just political economy. So I have to go to Paleolithic because I have to, you don't know what's weird about political economy after the Neolithic revolution if you don't understand pale, uh, Paleolithic political economy. And actually, quite frankly, and I make the argument in this course, you can't understand contemporary political economy without having understood Paleolithic political economy because it still functions. 
it's still operant today, right? So it's not like there's an evolutionary path. These things are layered on top of each other. And unless you stretch that time that far, you won't notice that they're layered. You won't notice. So I'm not sure if that really answers the question. Someone put the word stratification in here. Yes, yes, these are stratified matters. Absolutely. Um, and we just had a follow-up on that. Someone asked if you could get a, just a quick wording definition for political economy. Oh, yeah, we go through a long thing to define this in our course. So economy from this in this framework is how energy in all of its different configurations, literally calories, right? circulate through inside of a closed system. What, how, does it, how does energy circulate? How do, how do products circulate? How do services circulate? How does surplus circulate? Where is there insufficiency? Where is there too much, right? This is what economy is. Politics are the, is the power to control how energy circulates inside of a closed system, right? So political economy has got to do with uh, regulating the regulatory, the regulatory function of moving energy through a closed system. Energy has all kinds of meanings. Um, from food all the way to sending rockets to the moon, right? This is all can all be reduced to its caloric cost. All right. So that's what I mean when I'm saying political economy. It's the right, it's the regulatory, how you regulate the movement of energy through a system. I mean, politics, political systems do what? They tax, they spend. That's moving energy through a system, right? Taking surplus from over here, putting it over there, allocating it, generating it, supporting it. Okay. Right. And Who gets know, calories and when? Yes. <laughs> um, I know we, we had two questions then just uh, kind of on the working with students aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and we had uh, Volko had, had asked uh, just for the students, how do you fit together skepticism about human agency with having them play as, as teams to pursue objectives? Well, because they're when they're playing in teams, they're not playing Julius Caesar, right? They're playing in urbanity, they're playing a city, right? And it's odd to talk about a city as an actor, right? But inside of the political system of a city, there's all these apparatuses, bureaucracy, there are these working parts that are responding to the ecosystem and failures in their infrastructure and random events like plagues and wars and, and crazy stuff. So it's not that there is no such thing as human agency. It's that you can't rely on a human's belief in our own agency to explain or to make correlations. It's not, it's insufficient. It's not that it's wrong, it's that it's insufficient. Okay. So that tension between agency and or lack of agency and playing a game where, where, where the, the students have agency to make decisions is kind of not, a, it's, not a, it's not a good comparison because the students in playing the game are making primary documents. So they have the illusion of the agency, right? They're making primary documents. Um, but when they go and analyze somebody else's region at the end of the game, which is the large finished product projects, they're going to write the history of the great center stone region or some kind of thing like this, right? Um, they have all of this theory that's not about the human agent, right? And so they have to make a narrative based on this, th these, this, this range of theories explaining how come the king of so-and-so's attempt to do why didn't work because the other forces way beyond the individual are actually at work. I don't know. That seems like a lot of explanation for what probably was a simple question. No, I think it was really helpful. It actually kind of led us right into the, the second question uh, just on that topic, which was just asking in terms of, can, can you explain the, in, uh, just what happens um, with your students in terms of interaction between the teams? Um, right. is, it, is it, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, so um, the very first map is for the gaming, as the, is for the gathering and hunting um, piece of the game where they explore gathering and hunting political economy, all right? And in that, 
game, there's no way to interact with each other because the scale of a gathered hunter's, you know, uh, movement is so, so small, okay? Then you get to the next game and it expands, okay? The amount of area that they're dealing with for farming, for Neolithic revolution is much bigger than for gathering hunting, okay? And it's in this game, urbanity, that the boundaries of their awareness of their ecosystem gets wide enough that they start to brush up into each other, okay? So um, some of these city-states are gonna begin to trade with each other from great distances, right? They'll encounter each other's products, okay? That become objects that they want. Um, and that's at this level where they're mostly going to be interacting. So if you think about uh, the Indus River Valley, you find Indus River Valley uh, products all the way in, um, you know, all, all the way, you know, near Jericho, right? You find silk from Western China, you find that in, you know, it, it, Egyptian, uh, tombs, right, and <laughs> Pharaonic Egypt tombs. So they 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 become aware of each other's products at this time, but have, do not encounter each other directly. They will encounter each other directly in the next game. So there's lots of inter inter team gaming emerges as compared to team gaming against against me. Though they always game against me, but right. so that is there. Um, and then we had a, a really good question just from from Maurice, who uh, this came up when you were talking about. Um, the city itself as sort of its its own interconnected system. And mm -hmm. I, I think he phrased it really well, so I'll just kind of quote it verbatim. Talking about in global history, a great deal is made in that field about the emphasis on interconnectedness of systems, right? It's mm -hmm. like trade, political economy, political military hegemony, and so on. Mm -hmm. The way you speak of world history seems analogous. Do you think that's just semantics or is there a useful distinction there? No, 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 no. Uh, this is all part of the same... This is all part of the same thing. So, you know, as someone who's trained as a world historian, then I'm going to approach teaching world history in that, in using that language. So all of this is built on that language of world history. This is not, um, this is me leveraging world history into a game um, as a field. Um, so there's no distinction at all. That This is exactly what world history is um, from the Anal School perspective, the Anal School, uh, you know, and, you know, there are people who, who branched off from the Nall School, you know, you know, Wallerstein, and there, there are a lot of people who branched off and that to talk about world systems, world systems theory, that kind of thing. I disagree with this whole way of treating it as if we're somehow trying to explain how the capitalist West came to take over the rest of the world. I think that's monk and nonsense. Um, I much prefer somebody like uh, Janet Abelugod, who you know talks about how there's in a sense the the center of the world moves, but even I don't like the center of the world kind of notion. I, I don't I don't care for it. Um, but this is solidly inside of the the literature of of world history, as it's as it's written by scholars. Great, thank you. And I know um, I want to get back to the presentation. I have uh, one question and then two kind of quick ones, uh, and then then I'll then I'll shut up. Um, we just had a question come in uh, from Kenzie Scott Kramer that asks, um, "How is technology researched or disseminated uh, with your students? And do certain geographies encourage or, or promote certain technology? Right? So does does tech travel when you talk about those uh, just at the stage you are now with the cities sort of?" gently interacting, does tech travel similar to trade? It can, it can. Um, so for the most part, I keep the tech trees fairly simple, all right? So, you know, I wouldn't have regionally specific, regionally specific tech, okay? So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, uh, well, see, it's hard to say this because remember, we're in imaginary space. So I can't have like the, here's the Chinese nest of te technology, right? All that navigation stuff, right? All that silk stuff is over there, right? And uh, over here, there's all this, I don't know, I don't know, Toledo steel, multi-time folded, you know, Spanish steel came from the, you know, the Arabs that actually came from India. Like, I, I can't do that because we're not telling the story of tech tech development across time, all right? All I'm doing with tech is indicating to students the energy density of technology, the more complex it becomes. 
So the more complex a piece of technology becomes, the more sophisticated it becomes, the more calorically expensive it becomes. It's a huge investment, right? That uh, has to be paid for in some manner, right? Or he's, it needs to have a bureaucratic scaffolding behind it. It needs to have, you know, there's scaffolding that has to go behind it. And we'll look at an example of how you get from um, copper to bronze in this game, right? And show how all these other things, you have to have control of all these other things in order to enable bronze, right? Um, and so it's in that sense. And then there's also a lot of flexibility in there. So there are often, um, uh, if you build libraries and things like that, there are these things that if you can build certain kinds of infrastructure, you can then have an invention where then students can pitch to mean invention, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so, I, you know, I, things that I hadn't imagined or built into the system, they can say, well, what about this? I'm like, oh, that's, that's not a bad idea. Okay, let's roll for that. <laughs> Um, so they can also build build onto my kind of chassis for technology um, where they think it might be advantageous, which they do amazingly. And I one more kind of nitty gritty question was just do the, the students have a sense of the domesticated plants and animals that they have access to when they choose their city site? And then uh, Nicholas Proctor asked that and had, as an example, if my team has llamas, we might pick a different site than if we have like water buffalo, for instance. No, no. So if you were to choose a place that has uh, a lot of heavy, wet soil that would require uh, uh, water buffalo, right? Um, I would give the option to choose drainage and plowing. That, that basic, okay? If you were situated in a place, um, well, that's not even, if you were situated in a place that's dry and mountainous and cold, you have the option for drainage and plowing. You have the option, but it's a bad option. Does that right, make sense? Or it would make more sense for you to center it in, you know, what, extract energy from that system, you know, more ecologically appropriately. So, all of the technologies are available. The trick is for them to choose which is the one that's correct for this location. So for example, if we go back to the place where this, this group of students chose as being uh, the best location where they set their city state center stone, okay? They entirely forget that you can terrace in the mountains, gone. Even though we've lectured on, show 10 gazillion pictures of what Korea and China and Japan and the Andes look like. We've done this right? And talked about, you know, how you can, you know, sequester water and move it. We talked about this. They learned about this. They kind of like, just kind of default to like, well, we need flat land because like, where we're from the Midwest, right? Right? So they're assuming that that little, little tiny sea state I'm going to set up in the, in the mountains, that that's dinky and they should ignore it. That was a bad choice, right? Or no, it's not that it's a bad choice. It's that that choice has consequences. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. You know, it's not as it's not as sophisticated as a technology tree is, as well, I, I wish, right? But it's a 15 week course. Right, no, that, that, that makes sense. I uh, was born in the Midwest, so I'm sort of a homer for the Great Plains, but uh, no, that, I think right. it's a very, really valid point. Um, we had one last question came in and then I'll kind of press pause on the questions. So we, can, we can get back to the rest of the presentation. Okay. Um, but just sort of separate from, from kind of the nitty gritty questions, uh, Michael Dunn had asked just for your thoughts on commercially available so-called like Forex games like um, Sid Meier Civilization or Europa Universalis as a tool for narrative building. Well, they're fine for narrative building. They're just not good for historical narrative building. I mean, I would not use Civ to teach history. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use Civ. Use Civ. To, no, of course, I haven't played Civ. Uh, I think I probably played Civ three last time I played Civ. So who knows what it's done since then? But um, its hierarchy of its technological hierarchy it, it, it is not is not rational. Um, the, the way I understand it, it, it really isn't. Um, but could be could be how I played it. Um, but I think that 
probably not a popular opinion, but if that game were sufficient, I wouldn't have gone to the trouble to do this because it's not, it doesn't explain why or how. And if students play successfully, it doesn't tell me what they understood of what I needed them to know. If I could have bought this game off a of shelf, I would have done it. So I bet someone who designed it is actually on here. And now I feel like a schlemiel. <laughs> it's a great game. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. It's fun. But I don't think it's a good teaching tool for world history. Okay. Uh, be before we jump to the next portion of the, uh, of the presentation, I will invoke my host rights and go back a few slides. And so when you're showing this and when I saw the map, I was saying that right along the sort of straights up near the upper sea. Oh, Spain. that's strategic as heck. That's right. Strategic. So I, I saw, so as soon as I saw that, I, it reminded me of Constantinople, right? With like the Black Sea. The Black Sea, the right. Twin cities and giving all these waterways. I was wondering if that was somewhere, you, and you said that's not a spot. When you showed me that's where the students chose, I was like, no, that's obviously not the best choice. Uh, but no, I, I mean, was, you know, think about it. You're like, you guys are, a lot of you are war gamers, right? And these are college freshmen who are not war gamers. Or if they are war gamers, they're very kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know, very rudimentary war gamers, <laughs> right? And look, Civ doesn't let you say which place you want to start in. At least last time I played it, it didn't, right? It didn't give you the choice of where you wanted to start. So you, you couldn't say, oh man, that's strategic. I want that. You couldn't do that, right? That's a really strategic spot. That's one place I would have taken, right? Not the only one, but that's one place I would have taken. And you will see when you get to the slide where I'm like, okay, that's what you guys chose. Here's what I'm going to do. You're going to see that I chose all the good spots. Yeah, but they had the option. And that's why I was super curious for your next slides as we transition to the next portion of your lecture of sort of seeing where you thought uh, were the best spots. All right, so let's go back a few slides and proceed forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I so I think we're, we're all done with the questions. If anyone uh, does have other questions, please feel free to ask them. I will do a quick kind of Q&A at the end, but um, this has been really great. So please go ahead and I'll, I'll <laughs> shut off now. Okay. So we're gonna go back to some more foundational theories, okay? And the first one is, you know, second law of thermodynamics. Um, if, if we all know about uh, entropy and the complex systems can't sustain themselves, right? <laughs> this is kind of default to the poets, right? That, you know, things fall apart. Um, the, the most comfortable state for the universe you know, is anarchy or this d disorder. Order is very energy expensive, right? So if you've got a complex system, you gotta keep putting energy into it to keep it from succumbing to entropy. So succumbing to entropy is a fancy way of saying dying, right? And what's true for, um, you know, what's, what's true for stars and what's true, you know, uh, for your biological organ or, or, you know, organism is, is true for complex social structures, okay? So, that's one thing that is built into this system, all right? And we'll talk about it in a second, okay? Can you go on, all right? And then this is something that uh, Christian argues, oh, look at I put the wrong initial for his name, but Christian argues that this is true in history as well, okay? And that the more energy dense, the more complexity inside of a system, the more fragile it is. The more simple a society is, uh, the longer it lasts. So, I mean, you can think about this, right? Uh, gathering and hunting is what human beings have done for 99.5% of our time on this planet. Why? Because it works. <laughs> if it didn't work, we wouldn't be here. If it didn't work, they'd have changed to do something else, right? They changed to do something else in certain times and in certain locations because something went wrong there, okay? But the more complex a system that you build, the more fragile it gets. City states want to fall. This is what they want to do. I mean, how many are left now? Like Rome? Like I can think of one or two. City states don't want to don't want to stay. Empires don't want to stay. How many empires are still around now? No, they're fragile. We tend to think about them all as like, oh, power, power. Yeah, power is fragile. Okay. So I've got to build fragility and the causes of fragility into the map. You have the next slide. All right, so here go the corollaries. 
All right. Complexity is a result of resource insufficiency. This is something counterintuitive because somehow we've learned in our heads that resources are insufficient for gathering hunters and they're always living on the edge of starvation. If that was true, they wouldn't have done it for 99 point, right? They wouldn't have done it that long, right? Something worked with that, okay? Their solution to energy and to resource insufficiency was to get up and walk someplace else. They have really good, like, traveling skills like they've got tech the, the technology of mobility down pat both biologically and in terms of their information in terms of understanding where they are and reading the world around them right well once you're sedentary once you can't go anywhere you are in dire danger of insource insufficiency right this is a dangerous situation right and so when resources are insufficient you can and that pushes innovation you better do something which means you got to add more energy to the system right and that's going to cause complexity, right? So this is that kind of thing that this is the kind of series of relationships that causes complex political economies, complex political systems, complexity to emerge, right? It's necessitated. Please, please, if anyone ever tells you that after the Neolithic Revolution, human beings had surplus, so they had time to invent, that's bunk and nonsense. This argument says that crisis pushes change, not opportunity. Opportunity will push change when you get to capitalism. This is not then yet, okay? Anyway, click again and see what's on the other half of this. I can't remember. Ah, the efficiency axiom. So this is, this is something that I, I put in my course, okay? Sedentarism. Sedentary societies are chronically resource unstable. Chronically, right? If you're in one place and you eat up all the, 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 the grain in that one place, or you grow grain in that place for 200 years, your soil quality is going to go downhill, and so is your, your agricultural productivity going to go downhill, right? No matter what you do, you consume everything around you, right? Resource unstable. You can't just pull up stakes and go someplace else like way gathering hunters do, okay? Click again, please. And so, S sedentary societies are more <laughs> likely to experience extinction events, right? That's the second law of thermodynamics, right? They're more susceptible to it. Click again. Or they have to find a way to adapt. And you will see this with sedentary societies, right? There are plenty of small farming villages that are in marginally agricultural areas that when you have a uh, four or five years of drought or four or five years of like deluging rain, right? You have this happen and people quit farming. They go to, they, they go to pastoralism. They, they'll go move, you know, uh, their sheep or goats up and down hills and stuff. They'll go someplace else and they won't go back to farming until the ecosystem resolves itself or maybe they never go back to farming at all, right? Um, so you'll see this, there's this kind of mobility between um, you know, political economies. I mean, this is an example that happens with, you know, Genghis Khan, right? Uh, you know, when, when members of his family, his distant kin kill his father, right? And take all their sheep and leave him, him and his brother and his mother, like living on the edge of nowhere, they go back to gathering and hunting. They got no other way to eat. So, you know, when things happen, then people begin to adapt and, you know, make moves, try to survive. Okay. So you can be, you can go extinct, you can adapt or click again. You can innovate, and I describe innovation in two ways, aggressive innovation or innovative aggression, okay? Aggressive innovation is when you go like, dang, I know the water is going to like, we're not going to have water for, you know, for 10 months out of the year because that's how the monsoon works here. So we better find a way to, you know, build some holding, holding facilities to hold the water so we have it during the drought. Or now we got to, oh no, it's going to rain all the time. So now we got to dig some, you know, dig some canals and make some levees. You got to make moves. We got to change things, right? To uh, to push back the dangers of the ecosystem or to leverage the potential of the ecosystem, right? You can do that. Or you can innovate aggressively. That means war, take other people's stuff, all right? And most likely the innovation is both of those things at the same time, right? Uh, you, you use every technique you can when it's time to in innovate to, you know, reduce the possibility of, you know, succumbing to entropy, as it were, dying. Okay, so this is, you know, how I, I frame the efficiency axiom. That is, they have to build a maximally energy efficient political economy in order to even just stay, stay in the same state, no less to grow. Okay.
Next slide, please. Okay, now the question is, which are the critical resources in ancient city-states that are implicated in their growth and the projection of political power? That's the question, okay? And there are some interesting um, corollaries between scarcity and uh, the degree of political polarity with salt and tin as being seen as the critical mineral resources that are associated with the growth or the explosion of city-states um, in this transitional period between the Copper Age and uh, uh, the Bronze Age, right? Or in Copper Age, Copper Age societies and Bronze Age societies, let's say it that way, right? And so that the scarcer, right? The scarcer and the more transportable, let me see if I can say this in the right way, okay? The greater, the more something is scarce and or the more difficult it is to move, the more vertical your society is going to be, all right? Where a critical resource is easily accessed or there's a whole lot of it, you have a more, what, there's no way for anyone, there's no need for any one person to um, spend its resources to acquire the thing, all right? So in this sense that you're liable to get much more vertical monarchical structures where tin or salt are rare or hard to get, okay? And you're liable to get more democratic confederacy shaped uh, political structures where uh, salt or tin are either um, easy to access or there's a lot of it. And he, here's the thing, if you click the next one, uh, there's never a lot of tin. Tin is a terrible, is a terrible resource, okay? Um, a, it's really heavy and there's, you know, it's hard to move. But B, there just isn't a lot of it on the surface, okay? Copper is everywhere. Copper is very easy to find, very easy to access, right? But tin is scattered across the earth in very, very difficult to reach locations and in small amounts, right? And so there's a direct correlation between how many city-states there are right? Um, and the need for tin. Oh, wait, we're still talking about copper. I'm sorry, let me go back and talk about this image again. The discussion of tin is, is relevant to, to, to the presentation, but before I talk more about tin, I want to talk about metallurgy in itself and urbanization, okay? And this relates to tin, but first I have to talk about it in terms of copper, okay? City-states expand and explode across space as what? When smelting technology for copper begins to, begins to spread. These things happen at the same time. So there's the number of city-states that exist before you have smelting technology, that is when you have crucible copper technology, okay? Um, processing copper in the copper age originally was the same as like, you could pan for copper the same way you pan for gold. You can find it eroded out of, you know, in, in water, okay? And uh, if, as long as you can melt it, right? Uh, that copper that already exists in little copper, copper nuggets, okay? You can do that with, fairly low temperatures. As a matter of fact, gathering of hunters, they melted copper and made copper objects using crucible technology, okay? You can dig a hole in the ground. You can, you know, put your, your copper beads in there. You can blow, right? Or you can, yeah. so anyway, it, it, it's possible to do that. But to smelt, that means to extract it out of ore, right? That was the signature um, technological uh, advance um, that was followed by an explosion of city-states, all right? So, as you get high temperature kilns, right, capable of, of extracting copper from coke, right, from, from, from rocks, um, then you're gonna start to get a lot of city states, okay? So that's a lot of explanation to get onto the next slide. All 
All right, so if you recall what we were looking at here um, is a place that is got a lot of copper and has a lot of salt. All right, can you click again? See what comes up here next, I don't remember now. All right. And the central problem of being sedentary is that as you extract resources, it's gonna cause an insufficiency or an inefficiency, it's gonna deplete the resource. And as the resource is depleted, you can either innovatively aggress or aggress innovatively, right? Click again. All right. So in this game, population growth is what enables people to move out of agriculture into other kinds of occupations. This is you get more agricultural productivity, you're able to get more occupational specialization, right? So in order to push your grain surplus to en enable other technologies to, to begin to move, you have to terrace, you have to do drainage, you have to do irrigation, right? You gotta find a way to create surplus protein in this game. In order to have protein, it has to come with a salt to preserve it, okay? Sar salt, sardine plus salt equals an acceptable protein. Next, click again. And if your population grows large enough, if you're able to stop the, what, eating up your, 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 your resources, if you're able to keep your population high enough and to keep your population growing, then you're able to access the metallurgy tech tree, okay? And this is how it works, right? Everybody starts with low temp temperature kilns, in which they can make a brickyard and have fired bricks, all right? Low temperatures, if you have fired bricks, which uses crucibles, right? Plus copper, you can have a luxury item. So you can make little luxury items, little usually it's funerary items, right? Low temperature kilns plus timber will enable charcoal. Low temperature kilns plus timber will allow production pottery. Production pottery means you're making enough ceramics, low temperature ceramics to actually sell them more than you need, right? Production pottery plus charcoal, that will allow you to have a high temperature kiln high temperature kilns plus copper nuggets equals production metallurgy. Production metallurgy allows smelting. This is a problem though, okay? Once you begin to produce a whole lot, right, your copper nugget resources, it's gonna make a, a, a bottleneck. You're gonna have a, a drop in the number of amount of copper that's available to you, surface copper that's available to you by the time you get to production, production metallurgy, right? So you got to have some solution to that bottleneck production metallurgy plus transportation system means you have to have sufficient labor. If you're going to expand mine deeper or mine farther away, you got to have a population to do that. Mining is a, is a population, a labor intensive thing. Okay. So if your population growth is not keeping up, you can't go past 0.6. All right. You get to 0.8. You can mine. If you can mine, then you get copper and tin ores and you can do production metal smithing, which leads to bronze metallurgy. So you have to have, you have to go through all these kiln temperatures, kiln temperatures, making charcoal, right? In order to get to, you know, uh, this issue. And the whole point is that access to tin, access, steady access to copper and access to copper ore, that's going to cause city states to what you're going to, you're going to go find a mine location. You're going to, you know, set up a mine operation. The mine operation has to have uh, food and resources and water, right? You can't move food that far. So you have to have some people start to farm there. That's going to turn into a little tiny village, right? And, and so that's going to cause the metastasization, if I can use that ugly word, of urban spaces, trying to solve the bottleneck of copper and metallurgy. Right. This is an argument that has been made. And so this is the argument that I'm modeling or that I have um, leveraged inside of this game. Can you click again? Right. So population growth is critical to, you know, this very important um, 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 resource uh, that. Right. OK, <laughs> next slide. Where are we going? All right, more theory, okay? Here's where I have put my competing, oh, I don't have anything to point with. So here are the competing city states, right? So we got Soggy Bottom, 
We got slippery reed, slippery reed up there. Because when those guys expand, boy, somebody needs to control that that little tiny that little tiny opening, right? That's really critical. All right. Um, also down here, there's one that's called tin pan. There's only tin in one place in this location. It's in that crotch, right? So they're going to have access to controlling access to tin on that location, right? Um, I was also very interested in the potential of transportation trade by uh, these very much uh, kind of oceanic uh, island chain. So I put, uh, I put something in there. Um, and let's click again and see what else is here. All right, so this is my hypothesis, okay? That controlling that little location that would be like Constantinople, right? On the Black Sea, that that's critical. That controlling uh, a, a rare resource is critical. And this is stuff students have already, already know. They already know this stuff, so they're making choices. Um, it's not like I have a secret hold of this information. We've already lectured on this extensively, okay? And that transportation is really critical. So, um, I know where this game went. I'm going to ask you later where you think it would go. But um, let's go on and see what else we have. All right. Now, more theories. Because we have to deal with trade, right? The gift is a curse. Can you click again? All right. Can you click one more time? All right. So there are economic sociologists who um, try to understand the mechanism of trade and how it begins in the ancient world, all right? Um, and they have, uh, what the, the sociologists that I pay attention to have uh, a sense that the gift is actually uh, a problem. If someone gives you something, it's a problem because you have when someone gives you something, a sensation of being indebted to them, right? And being indebted to someone is a form of obligation. That is, you know, uh, you sent me a, a, a fruitcake uh, for Christmas this year. And that means next year for Christmas, I should probably send you a fruitcake. This is just general kind of, um, this notion is something that we start earlier in the course, but the sense of reciprocity of social relations being a dance of reciprocity is something that we work with. So the politics of exchange, according to this theory, um, has to do with gifts, debts, obligation, and the return of one's obligation so you are not indebted to another person. To give someone a gift is to make them in your debt, which is to have some kind of control over them. And as someone who's still paying back student loans, I can tell you that there's some reality to this matter. Can you click again? All right. And with that in mind, I have to people the peninsula, okay? Come on, come on, come in. I have to pe people the peninsula with people to whom one gives gifts and creates relationships of obligation, okay? So here we've got uh, one, two, three, four, four different uh, uh, ethno-linguistic groups, Pakeshi speakers, Shattered Stone peoples, Reed Weaver peoples, Pu'uka speakers, because the rules by which we give gifts and have expectations of obligation in return depends on who we're doing it with, all right? So I have to people this space, not just with um, materials. I, I need to create not just scarcity in this space. I have to imbue it with diversity, okay? Can you click again? All right, so here's the rules of cursing people. That is making people in your debt, creating people who are obliged to you, okay? I'm gonna to try to make this real simple, all right? The closer someone is to you by blood, that's degrees of consanguinity, right? Your kin, your close kin, okay? The more willing you are to willing you are to give something to someone and get nothing in return, or to get only a little bit in return, or to get it in return in ten years or fifteen years. Anybody ever loaned their brother fifty dollars? Do you ever expect to get that back? Well, you kind of like to maybe, but you're not going to like be calling them on the phone saying, "Where's my fifty bucks? Where's my fifty bucks?" 
right? It's, it, it's, it's a relationship of sharing the closer those people are related to you uh, by blood. And this is how I have this explanation um, that, you know, the pure gift is like breastfeeding a baby. You don't expect anything back. You just give, right? But the further you move away, the more you begin to want someone to repay you for your, no, no, repay is the wrong word. They, they're obliged to you for your generosity, all right? And the farther away, the more, the less likely they are to pay you. So you want it back. You really want it back. And you begin to ask them, where's my 50? Where's my 50? Where's my 50? Okay. So there's this argument that social relations are actually a form of mutual obligations that have to do with exchange, giving and receiving, giving and receiving. Okay. And, uh, it even carries into the negative range. This is negative reciprocities, where if someone is far enough away, you want a horse trade. You want, you want, uh, you know, this is how this is like uh, talking to a used car salesman, right? You want a little bit more than what you're giving. You're going to try to make a deal that's in your best favor, even if it shafts the other guy. Okay, and of course, the the far end of that spectrum is, you know, just killing people and taking their stuff, right? That's theft or you know genocide would take everything just poop okay that's and that is people who are the least related to you these are people who are so far away from you that the consequences of you doing them wrong will not rebound on you okay you can't <laughs> I, you can kill a member of your family um but it rebounds on you there are political systems where that's normal right but it rebounds on you okay so you're going to have um kinds of social relations that are positive. These are generalized reciprocities with people who are related to you and people who are nearby to you. And the further they are away from you, the more you're going to stick it to them, stick it to them, stick it to them, try to get something for nothing. The very middle, this balanced reciprocity location is kind of the theoretical middle where there is no social relation formed because I gave you exactly what you gave me in value, right? This happens when you go to the grocery store, you go to the grocery store, five pounds of butter costs X, you go there, you give them X, you get the butter, you leave, you have no positive sensation about that place or negative sensation about that place. If you go to the grocery store and the butter is priced too high, right? This is a negative reciprocity. You got shafted. That means you don't go back, right? That means you have a negative relationship with that person now. You'll tell everybody, ah, their butter's too expensive. Oppositely, you go to a store and butter is unusually cheap. You're like, whoa, I got a deal, right? And then you tell everybody, hey, they've got cheap butter. And now you've got a positive relationship. You want to go back to see if they've got cheap flour next, cheap eggs next. Now you've got a relationship, okay? So relations, social relations are about reciprocity according to this theory, which is how come I've peopled this entire place with people who, depending on where you situate your city state, you are either more related to them, further related to them, they're physically farther away from you. And that's going to determine how much it's going to cost you to get something from them. All right. If you are far, far, far away from somebody and you want a military alliance with them, you better not show up with a cheesecake saying, hey, you want to have a military alliance. It's going to cost you what's in it for them. Or better yet, if they show up from far away talking to you saying you want a military alliance, you're like, hmm, how can I squeeze them? Now, if you're Right. If your if your nephew comes to you and says, we need a we need a military alliance, you just like cough up men right away because this is a member of your family, they're nearby, you I have your back, you're my brother. Okay. So those are the rules of cursing. That's the rules of exchange, political exchange, economic exchange that govern this space. Can you click again? Okay. This is an example. This is from this game. Centerstone dispatches a royal delegation to the overseer of the city of Tin Pan seeking, click, a military alliance against the kingdom of Sweet Pook and Tin Pan bronze smiths willing to relocate to Centerstone. Click. I don't know if you get this, but. The outcome of this is that the overseer of the city of Tin Pan sent all of the severed heads of the delegation pickled in fine barrels back. That was the answer, all right? There will be no, 
no, what do I say, industrial espionage here with a total stranger from a totally different state, from a totally different ethnic group. That's not possible. So these that attempt got hit, right? Um, because that's violating the whole the whole rule of um, of reciprocity. Okay, next one. Next slide. We're almost done. Okay. Now I want to remind you that just because these maps have theory embedded in them and that the mechanics try to uh, make students play against the map, um, that, you know, um, maps are an embodiment or a communication, a way of, you know, of, of communicating complex things, okay? And so it doesn't have to be geographical. But in this case, um, you know, what's important is that I'm making a physical embodiment of multi-layered complexity. Students have a very hard time. Can you click again? I think this is here. Right. It's very difficult to teach complex ideas where um, there are multi-directional issues going on simultaneously. If I just explain it with my mouth, uh, students will hang on to one and all the others will disappear. Okay. So what I've done is I, I've made the complexity, I've externalized the complexity into a place. So it's just not the professor's mouth moving. Okay. So it's really hard to teach complex ideas. Click. And students, or at least young adult learners, are very resistant to complexity because they've been accustomed to uh, monocausal uh, explanations for things that are actually really complicated. Click again. All right. So I'm trying to put complexity in praxis, not talk about it as abstractions, which is a lot of what I've done here. Talk about it as an abstraction, right? I've got to make it externalized so students experience it and don't just hear it through through their ear hole, okay? Uh, go ahead. All right. And I I want to as a as an educator, right? Not default to you know argumentum ab autorite, or autoritate. That is a uh, I'm right because I'm the professor. Right, I'm an authority figure, so my explanation of why Julius Caesar did what Julius Caesar did, you know, that that trumps whatever your high school teacher told you. Or, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want students to be submissive to those claims to authority. Right. So rather than claiming authority and like, well, look, at I'm, a I'm a professor who studied this stuff, so therefore, believe me, all this complexity is true. I just put the complexity out there and let them fumble around in it. That, that's what I'd rather do, um, because then they can absorb as much of complexity as they are able without me having to, you know, like, I don't know, default to authority, which never works. It's a terrible pedagogy. OK, next. All right. And then here's really, really what's important. One of the things I find important is theory rich maps, they bridge. 21st century structure and ideological relationship with the environment, right? Which is disconnected, right? Uh, it reconnects it to our species historical structural and ideological relationship with the environment. So if I'm making the argument that human beings, in order to be human beings, exist in place, not just space, not, not, not like objects bobbing around in an empty place. We're like in a place that acts on us, right? It's hard for 21st century student to absorb this because we feel like we're not. We are, but it doesn't feel like it. Okay. So to, to make the argument that human beings are in a historical materialist uh, situation and the political economy is related to where you're living and the, and, and the pressures that are on you, right? I have to make that externalized because otherwise they will never, they will never make that connection. So this is partly why I've done it the way I'm doing it. Can you click again? I think there's only one more of these. Oh, yes, the problem of historical empathy, that's what I'm talking about. Click again, please. Yeah, here, theory-rich maps demonstrate the fragility of knowing. Right, so we can't always know why Genghis Khan did what he did. And in making a narrative about that, depending on who's making a narrative, the answer will be different, right? So this enables that. And it also stresses that history, we say this in history, it's contingent. We have a sense in our heads usually that 
things that happened in the past had to happen. They could not have happened any other way. Um, that was the, whatever outcome happened was the normal outcome where, or the necessary outcome, right? Where that's not true. There are so, there's so much complexity in, in, in any given kind of uh, historical emergence that the, the details that tip a, a decision, a, a result in one direction or another, um, it, things, things hang on hairs, on, on threads, right? And so there's no wrong answer in this game. There are only consequences. And so people's, the political economies that these students develop are sometimes peculiar and have no kind of antecedents, you know, don't, don't exist in any, any place in history, but other ones do. And they're problem solving specifically to the challenges that they're encountering. And that is the history that they're going to be able to examine and then create a narrative about, okay? So fragility of knowing and the contingency of history is something that I really want my students to understand. Um, one more, I think. Uh, never mind, risk aversion, young adult learners. Yeah, this is about getting over risk aversion um, and uncertainty. I want my students, now oh, I can click this one more time, right? I want my students to understand that history is a narrative form that's made by historians, that it's created. Historians commit history the way people commit murder, right? History is not what you know, okay? It's not a knowing. It, it's not like who, it's not, you, you make knowledge. It's not you receive it, right? So we're not just listening to a story about the past. We're gaining tools to write a story about the past. And I want them to see that and to experience that. And uh, these maps give them um, more agency and uh, potential to do that. I think this may be the last slide. I think there's one more, let's see. What do I got on here? I'm curious if people will play along, okay? Click, click, click again. I, I, I'm wondering if you guys could predict the outcome for this, all right? And maybe you could just put A, B, C, D or whatever in the, in the chat or something, right? I don't know. An absolute theocracy, merchant confederacy, a diarchy. What do you think? I am personally rooting for Soggy Bottom. Just not only for the empire of Soggy Bottom would be awesome, but I am looking at that copper insult right south of it. So, yeah, yeah. Soggy Bottom sounds good. Well, what's interesting is that if you go back to the uh, ethno the ethno linguistic map, you'll see that center stone, soggy bottom, and slippery uh, slippery whatever reed they're all the same ethno linguistic group. They're all swamp people, right? So that actually works out to their advantage. Anybody want to make a guess about? I don't know. Are people putting guesses in. What I think? D never. Okay. But this is my last slide at any rate. So. I was just curious what people thought about what would happen. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, here's a bibliography on here if you want to take a look at it. All right, that's what I have prepared for you for today. That's awesome. I'll hand it over to Grant for questions, but I'll leave this slide up. Yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Hintz. That was really good and I, uh, I had some flashbacks to a couple burritos that I've asked my younger brother to buy me that he has still held over my head to this day. So <laughs> the whole giving gifts thing is, is hit me very hard. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's tricky. Um, we had a, a couple of questions in the class, uh, in, in the chat, um, and they're kind of a, kind of a wide range. So I'll, uh, I'll kind of try and give some context for all of them. Um, just when, when we were back on the, the slide about the corollary, corollaries, um, the question from Ella who asked, uh, so why did human society move towards sedentarism if it's innately unstable? I mean, it, right. could that just be an issue of, of uh, humans being myopic? Right, no, no. So uh, humans don't move towards sedentarism. Humans in particular locations do, right? Which means that there was an ecological change that made gathering and hunting not function well, all right? And any place that ecological change did not happen, people continue to hunt and gather. As a matter of fact, where urbanism has not penetrated, hunting and gathering still operates today. So hunting and gathering didn't go away. It's just that the ecosystems around it have been compromised in some way that make it not functional. 
non non functional. Okay, so the last ice age. Okay, when the ice sheets retreated, it totally changes the ecosystem around the belly of the planet. Right, doesn't change it further than the belly of the planet. Right, but it changes it really seriously in that area. So people have to figure out different ways of like me, me, making their 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 calories go through an entire year. All right, in the sense that if you can't follow animals that you can eat, if you can't follow plants that you're going to eat, okay, um, because wherever you go, there's nothing but grass. Grass is what fills in, you know, what emerges in large swaths of the, around the belly of the planet after the last ice age. You gotta, you gotta figure out something else where, when there's no water, right? Low water conditions are something that's very difficult to tolerate. Grass grows where there's low water. Now you gotta figure out something else. What are you gonna eat, grass? Well, yeah, yeah. So you're gonna start to look for surplus because you know surplus is gonna save you against a rainy, rainy day. You go where the water is. Once you go to the water is, everyone's going to where the water is. Well, there's plenty of water so then people reproduce there. Now there's less places to go. You can't leave the water, but there's more and more population there. Well, you gotta make sure you have surplus to make it through the time when there's not gonna be enough food. Now, once you've got surplus, you can't move. Once you can't move, you gotta figure out like, huh, how do I keep it from rotting? How do I keep uh, you know, the animals from creeping and you know, running away with my seeds? Oh no, what do I do to keep you know, the next people you know, two, two valleys over from coming over here and relieving me of my surplus? Like, then you have to solve a bunch of other problems. So it happens in locations. It's not a when, it's a where, okay? And then of course those locations, once you're sedentary, you know, you can eat up all your resources real fast. So you gotta find a way to protect yourself from the vagaries of the weather and the vagaries of the, the, the what, I don't know, the, the ecosystem in which you're living, right? Population is gonna go up, right? Uh, then you're gonna end up using up more. So now you gotta, Get a little bit bigger, you gotta get a little bit bigger, and all the people who are around you either have to accommodate you or go to war with you. The gathered hunters who used to live way out on the edges, they get pushed further out, right? So it changes, it metastasizes and changes things further and further and further out from itself, right? So, and that takes a long time. So that's what somebody asked me. Someone asked the question, I'm, I'm going on and on and on because I'm, uh, you know, an anxious and neurotic person. But does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think that was. I guess you can't say anything. Oh, no, I'm not used to talking to people with no faces. It's so strange. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I believe it was Ella that asked it. So Ella, if you do have a follow-up question, please do feel free to, to toss it in the chat. Um, separately, we had a, a couple of comments that were kind of complimenting just uh, the, the, the job that you were doing in terms of uh, designing all this and sort of facilitating it. And one question branching off of that from, from Volko is that to, to what degree could a designer incorporate that the kind of theory you, you've talked about into a map and rules so that someone who doesn't know the theory um, could play accordingly without having the, the designer or in this case in, in you there, you know, teaching them and kind of coaching them. Well, This may be short-sighted on my part um, because this is a course. It's not a game. It's not a toy, right? Uh, my students may have fun doing this, but frankly, I don't care, <laughs> right? They didn't pay me for to, have, to have fun. They paid me to change how they think. So my goal with this is um, not really, or has not been for entertainment. And so this doesn't make sense without the course. Some, someone asked me, oh, wow, can you, can you send me your playbook? I mean, there's nothing, to, there's no thing to send you. I can send you my syllabus, <laughs> right? Um, different pieces of the games, of the five games can be played without knowing a lot of theory first, right? I suspect that if you tried to play this game without any theory, I think it would just devolve into Civ, which Sid Meier's does such a beautiful job. Why would anyone want to play this? Like, play Civ. Uh, otherwise, it would just devolve into that. And, you know, so uh, that's fine, but that's not what this game does. So I think of this as a teaching tool 
um, that may occasionally be uh, entertaining, often is very frustrating to students, very frustrating, um, because my, my purpose is education, not entertainment. So I think that, I think that if I pull, if I tried to just do this without anything else, without any, any of the support structures, without the reading, secondary sources, um, it wouldn't, it would just be a really bad game. <laughs> I think it's really who made those yucky maps like why would anyone want to play this if it wasn't in the class I, I can't see it if you can see it please tell me others of the pieces like the, the the gathering hunting game I think that that would work but not this one the simplest game before it gets complicated this way so actually we just had a question um from Maureen that just came in which I think relates kind of nicely um was how have you defined your learning objectives for the game modules Oh, goodness, everyone has one. Um, each game has its own objectives. Like I point, point, I posted the objectives on this game at the, er, early when I described the game. Um, so I, I would have to, I'd have to go and break open the materials for the Blessed Share, Bosses Embossed, Hypothesis and Empire. I'd have to break them out and look at them, but each one is very different. So, um, I'm not sure to answer the question because it's like a it's like a technical question that I could like I can't quote it, but th those exist. There there are objectives for each game. There are, unless you're asking for something different than you know, like the slide I said. This is the task. These are the these are the objectives. These are the things I want you to learn. Um, and then we had a question from Nicholas Proctor asks, at the, at the end of the game, do players see how their map fragments fragments relate to one another or one another spatially? Or is that something that's maybe visible throughout? Wait, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry, I, I asked, at the, at the end of the game, do players see how their map fragments relate to one, to one another yes. spatially? Or is that yes. something they, they see kind of throughout? Well, insofar as they actually have made relationships with other places, right? So. Um, this is actually a, a, a mega continent, right? And they have to be really quick and aggressive to explore the whole thing, really aggressive, right? But what happens is, is you know, I mean, Rome, Rome sent a trade mission all the way around on the water to, to Han China, right? Looking for silk because the Persians wouldn't let him have the secret of it, right? So they had this, you know, one single voyage, which both China and Rome comment on in their, in their primary documents, right? But they never encountered each other very seriously, right? At least not that early, right? So, um, and so far as, you know, if empires are close to each other, they encounter each other a lot. They go to war, they make treaties, they have trade deals, they intermarry, like that kind of stuff is all possible. But the further away you are, the less likely that is to happen. And at the end of the game, what, well, what happens in the course is that we often look at each other's maps and think about them you know, analytically. Like, so I would show, for example, this map to the entire class and have each team give an argument about how come they would put a city state here, you put a city state here and make an argument about why, okay? And then go off and play the game, right? So um, they see each other's maps um, and they have opportunity to analyze each other's um, locations and to analyze each other's historical materials, um, the archives of materials that they're producing. So, And just on that note of, of geographical proximity, we had a, a couple questions. One from Mackenzie, who asked, did you find that the emphasis on geography, sorry, the emphasis on geography lends itself to a certain degree of geographic determinism? Uh, geographic determinism, only if you're simple headed about, about what theory can do, right? So, um, you know, I mean, Jared Diamond uh, kind of falls into that hole of everything this location, 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 baby, <laughs> right? Um, no, this. game imposes harsh penalties for doing things that the geography says you can't do and has a harsh penalty for everything the geography says you must do. Between those two poles 
are everything we can do. And even things I can't come up with myself, right? So, you know, I have students who are like experiencing, you know, what looks like, you know, you know, the bubonic plague. And somebody wants to figure out how can I make a crematorium to burn all my dead so they don't lay around. Like, like so they they can make choices of things or, or you know, so someone wanted to, to, to begin to import, uh, they, they wanted to know if they could, uh, you know, import, uh, what, cannabis, right? Or export cannabis. And I'm like, well, yeah. Right, and then set up. I mean, this is the beginning of a of of, of you know a, a drug trade. So you know, if they can imagine it, this game will hold it. It only imposes penalties, harsh penalties, when you do something impossible. Like, why would you invent or use snowshoes when you live in the desert? Like, right? These kind of irrationalities. Why would you Why would you invest in terracing when you have no mountains? That burns you. Does that make sense? Otherwise, the point is everything that can be done, not to say, well, you, you know, these are the only things you can do. It's all about what you can do, not the only, not, not, yeah, I don't know how to say that. There's boundaries on the outside, but there's a lot of squish in the middle. Does that make sense? No, I, I, so. I think it really does. And, and uh, I just realized we're, we've hit eight right on the dot. Um, oh, okay. Dr. Hins, this was really, really incredible. Um, and I, I will say just uh, having having hosted quite a few of these webinars, this was um, some of the most engagement I've kind of seen in the uh, in the chat, just in terms oh. of questions and comments. I'll do uh, one last question from, from uh, Mackenzie, I know just came in, who's just asking how, how did the map turn out? You know what? I've taught this so many times that I can't recall entirely. I do recall that it turned into a, a battle between uh, the people who are the reed weavers, that is the center stone, soggy bottom, slippery, uh, slippery reed. Those people are all part of the same uh, ethno-linguistic group, so they could create um, kind of uh, intermarriage, kind of a, a, a you know, unification very easily. And uh, a Tin Pan and um, and uh, Sweet Pook had worked out a trade deal um, where it was, you know, uh, bronze for, you know, essentially all the agricultural uh, resources that they these people could import from a different region, right? From another from another area that's not on this map. Um, and so Tin Pan ended up taking slaves for their for their mining. Like they enslaved all the people, all the little tiny villages that are around there, and you know became slave slave takers and slave merchants. And so it was you know, like the good guys against the bad guys. And even though even though you know ancient slavery here is like in this era is just like war slavery, debt slavery, like that's absolutely critical as economic as, as an economic matter, you know. Generally, students in the United States just can't go there. Like, oh, and I have a black professor too. Like, oh, slavery's bad. We can't go there. I'm like, mm, no, I'm not gonna have any trouble with this. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, that's what I seem to recall it coming to a, a head between these two powers, and that they were not resolved until the next game. This is what I'm remembering. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I uh, I know we had a couple people drop, but it, it really again a lot of engagement for everyone. So just to everyone who is um, on on the call, huge thank you just for being so so engaged. Um, Find me on uh, on uh, Twitter if you still have questions that didn't get answered, or uh, send me emails to SIUE. That's fine. I'm happy to to pound and answer you in more detail. Perfect. Okay. And then if anyone does have any kind of other questions that pop in late in their head, we, we do uh, put these recordings on our YouTube channel. That's uh, Georgetown University Wargaming Society, um, usually up within a day or so. Um, okay. I'll stop rambling, but thank you again. Uh, this was really, really great. And we really appreciate you coming. My by. pleasure. My pleasure.